Um, and, uh, and John uh, selected Dylan to write a piece that'll be premiered. And Carolyn, I thought it would be nice to, uh, for my associate conductor, Carolyn Kwan, will do the premiere on the program next weekend. So welcome, Dylan. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> and uh, John Wineglass, uh, it's, I know John for quite a while from many festivals, and uh, John makes his home nearby. And uh, I, David Kahn, I don't know if David's here. David has uh, sponsored, oh, David, maybe you stand up also and be acknowledged so everybody can see you. David. David has been uh, incredibly supportive, particularly of our educational programs, our free family concert for years now. And uh, John uh, and David approached me with the idea of uh, incorporating some of the um, poetry and the texts that were written by uh, young people um, in the juvenile facility here. Uh, in Santa Cruz, and uh, that's exactly what he's done, and his piece will be premiered tonight, the result of that. And then my, I think I know you the longest, Greg, it's hard to believe because you look so young always, um, uh, and I feel so old, but um, <laughs> Greg Smith is uh, my friend from uh, when we were in our 20s, or at least I was, uh, you must have been in diapers, and uh, <laughs> And this is, uh, to, on Sunday we're going to premiere, is it the fifth piece you've uh, written for us? I believe so. Yeah, yeah the fifth uh, piece he's written for uh, family concerts and, and uh, very excited about it. We played about 10 minutes of it this morning. I mean, we will rehearse it before. Oh, that's tomorrow, isn't it? Yeah, Sunday. But we decided that every day here is like a dog year or a dog day, so it's at least like seven days here. And uh, of course, it's my pleasure to welcome back uh, James McMillan. Jimmy was here 10 years ago and uh, didn't want to make it a habit, so he's back now, a decade later, and we'll premiere a brand new piece that he's written, which is absolutely spectacular um, tonight, as everything he writes is. And then Bezad, uh, we first uh, met as composer last year when Jean-Yves Thibaudet played his piano concerto, and he graciously um, agreed to, um, probably before he knew how much work was involved, to. Um, to look at all the scores submitted and select the three young composers and oversee the composers workshop. And I'm performing a piece of his next weekend at the Mission. And then Juan Ro is a new composer to the festival. Very excited to meet him and, uh, and do his piece tonight. So a different, different perspective, different voice. And uh, he's very engaged right now in writing his second opera, is that right? Uh, yeah, I can't imagine writing in my first opera. But um, so let me just, uh, you know, immediately throw it uh, to you for questions. Yes. Oh, and I'm sorry, I'm supposed to. I was told many times. Please wait for Elizabeth with the microphone to ask your question so that everybody can hear it. There you go. Yes, I'd like to ask James McMillan if he could tell us uh, some of the specific Im images and paintings that inspired his his piece, because he, they, he talks about them in the program, and but I never found out what they were. Thank you. Yes, uh, well, I mean, first and foremost, um, the inspiration is um, scriptural. Um, the woman of the apocalypse is this rather strange um, figure in the book of Revelation. But many uh, visual artists have painted her and, and made images of her through history, some of them very ancient, including uh, Dürer, who made a beautiful woodcut of her in the Middle Ages, which was a direct inspiration on me. And Paul Rubens has painted her in a, in a, in a, <coughs> a rather um, uh, beautiful, um, uh, luscious, uh, colorful painting. And then in, in more recent times, or um, coming more up to date, someone like William Blake, has made some made a, a, a wonderful and quite disturbing picture of this figure uh, fr from the story, um, and it's a woman that's it's at, the, at the middle of some kind of cosmic turbulence. There's a, a war going on round about her, and there's a, a terrible dragon uh, trying to devour her and her child. It's a strange, almost nightmarish vision, which ha has attracted many artists in the past, but not composers yet. Uh, so I thought uh, in responding to 
both the original narrative, but also, or the dream at least, um, St. John's dream, but also to these marvelous paintings through history, I would try to respond in my own way uh, in sound by painting uh, the picture in sound. Next question, uh, over here. Just so you know. I'm getting quite a lot of feedback up here. Is there any way to minimize that? Thank you. So this is for John Wineglass, and I'm just curious, the poetry that you have from these kids who are in the facilities here, do they have a chance to listen to what the end product is with the music? Uh, they will. Uh, eventually we will do that. I was actually there last night and, uh, and one of the poets uh, actually showed in his name in the credits and everything and, and showed in the score where his, where his words were making magic. So, but uh, we hope to do that actually after uh, in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Okay, over that way, yes. Uh, this is for John Wineglass also. Uh, did you come away with any general conclusions um, about the kids that wrote the poems about their lives and how they happen to get in the circumstances they are? Yeah, I was pretty much made privy to, to, to each of their situations. I uh, can't really comment on them here, but, uh, but yeah, um, um, three of them are still uh, incarcerated. Um, I think one is on probation and uh, the other one is in, in Juvie, who I saw last night. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we talked in specific. I had several interviews with them and discussed. Uh, my basic question is, how did we get here? You know, and, and we would talk through several decisions that they made in their lives. And, and I was, I'm hoping that this piece, I know, in talking with them, is um, helping them change their direction. One, one kid I talked to last night actually just finished his second course in college. Um, so I'm hoping to make a difference in that way. I thought this would be a nice, uh, nice isn't the right word, but a, um, uh, you know, a, a good way to follow up the project that we started the festival with, the Hidden World of Girls, you know, because uh, I, I think all of these, all these stories are so rich that each of us has. And, uh, you know, this is a, a little, a small window into these kids' lives and, you know, they're just around the block from, from us here. Yeah, anybody else? Yes, I'd like each one of the composers to let us know how do you conceive a new piece of music? Do you visualize it first? Do you hear music? What? Juan Rowe, why don't you, why don't oh. you begin? Uh, at least for me, I actually, um, I, for this piece, I have a tune uh, which I improvise first, which you will hear tonight. And then I use that tune and make it into a material for the orchestra. And at the end, the tune comes back. Yeah. Bezat? Sure. Well, greetings, everyone. Um, I think each piece is different for me. Um, sometimes the work has a program, has a storyline, like the one that you're going to hear next week. Next weekend, uh, it's called Seven Passages Inspired by uh, Persian Legend. And, uh, but at present time, I'm writing a concerto, and certainly the characteristics of the instrument plays a huge role in shaping the music. So that's more on the abstract uh, part. Uh, sometimes you respond to a poetry and sometimes you respond to experience in your own life. So, uh, at least for me, uh, the sources of inspiration are varied. I mean, but what happens, I think, for non-composers, I, I have a hard time understanding whether you wake up in the morning and, oh, there's my new symphony. I mean, <laughs> does that happen, and what happens? Or do you stare at that blank page and say, oh my God, I have to write a symphony? You know, or does it vary, or? There's a story about this. Um, it, was, it happened in Paris, and uh, Ravel, Maurice Ravel, was uh, in a cafe on the sidewalk, 
um, sitting, smoking his cigarette. And a friend came by and said, Maurice, uh, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm waiting here. So a few hours passed. The friend came back, saw Maurice Ravel exactly in the same place, smoking his cigarette. He said, Maurice, you're still here. What are you waiting for? He said, I'm waiting for the music to come. <laughs> so it could be a long <laughs> time for the music to come and many cigarettes to go. <laughs> Jimmy? The curious thing about music is that, um, as Bejad has, has indicated, that uh, it is an abstract form at, at its most fundamental level. Um, it's probably the most abstract mm -hmm. of the arts. And, uh, and musicians are, are, are rightly proud of that. You know, you know that um, at that fundamental level, music communicates all its power, uh, all its fluency, without anything else. Um, without needing to be explained, uh, it, it, it is its own stuff, its own sounds, and the way that the sounds are organised. However, also as Bejad was um, implying, uh, music does sometimes enter into collaborations with the other arts, um, um, quite wonderfully. In the, in the case of opera, um, when words are set to music, and then it moves into a, a different sphere altogether. Uh, it can collaborate with theatre, it can collaborate with film, it can collaborate with literature and, and the visual arts. Uh, and so, as well as it being the, the most abstract of the arts, it's also a very uh, representational art as well. Um, we can make abstract uh, works, like symphonies, that don't need any other explanation. Or uh, there are pieces, like, like the piece that, of mine that's been done tonight, which is a kind of tone poem. And I've, I've always wondered whether um, people can still write or should, should be still be writing tone poems in the 21st century. It's, it's an art form that we associate with the 19th, and some people might say it's very old-fashioned to uh, maintain it, but I, I would disagree with that. Um, and, and music has always had these controversies um, between those who prized the most abstract music as the best, uh, you know, that... that um, the pure music of the symphony or the sonata form that is not representational is in some way higher than uh, those other forms of, of music which um, try to represent things. And that's, an, uh, as you're probably aware, that's an ongoing debate. It wasn't just a, a debate that people had in the 19th century. We're still arguing about it now. Um, I, I try to do both, I suppose. Yeah. But how do you get, I mean, what happens uh, for, uh, to get inspired, or do you, is is that an over uh, overused term? I mean, is it more practical? Well, I, I think in many of my conversations with my fellow composers, um, it's quite clear that we have very different types of inspiration. Each composer can be inspired in many different mm -hmm. ways, um, and that's the lovely thing about it, but it's, it can also be the frustrating thing about it as well, in that we're not sure when the inspiration will come or how it will come. It could simply be an abstract idea, a, a sound, a, a melody. Uh, some of us still like writing melodies, uh, thankfully. Um, or a harmonic sound, or a, a, a color, a, a musical color. Or it could be the reaction to something uh, external to music, you know, something happening in the world mm -hmm. now, and you know, some people are, write political pieces, and uh, or um, w one reacts to the the other arts, as I have done in this piece. You know, um, uh, it's not just scriptural. Yes, yes, it is a religious piece, I suppose, but it's also a, a response to other artists. Mm. If I could just echo what James uh, mentioned. Um, this is a little secret among the composers, but most composers also are influenced by other compositions. But they never mentioned that I was influenced by Bach or my, my colleague. Um, but painters often go to exhibitions and are very much inspired by what they see, and then they create their own style. But I think that goes on with, um, in music as well. A number of large works um, were written, inspired by somebody else. 
for example, the Goldberg variation was very much insp inspirational for many other um, variation form in large uh, scale that was written in 19th and 20th century. So, but, you know, we try to keep it as a secret. <laughs> right. Right. Don't, don't worry, no one's listening. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, for me, I ha I'd have to say that the best ideas come on their own schedule, on that Ravel schedule. Yeah. Um, I'm, I feel a little bit like the diner chef up here. Uh, and many times people place an order and they want a grilled cheese and, and they don't want to wait a long time for it. So I have to meet a deadline. You're the guy. I'm the guy. I can make her grilled cheese, yeah. Um, I don't like the reference of cheese on that as much as I <laughs> did when I started. but. Uh, <laughs> so I have to conjure. I have to hasten things along. And sometimes I have to settle for what I've got at that point in time. That's me. And uh, Greg, besides writing, uh, <coughs> writing these family pieces, he, he also writes for a lot for film. For uh, you know, so uh, this is what we're talking about. You know, music being uh, also uh, just so um, important to other dimensions of our lives I and mean, there's more we probably hear more music today than we heard in the entire gosh you know in, a, in the eight, entire 18th century I bet you know you just I mean you can't escape it in a way every restaurant I go into I'm just I go crazy I don't know about you but um, so uh, um, it's a different I think it must be a different kind of pressure when you have to deliver a piece you know in a certain time frame or when you have uh, a few months or even a, a few years to work on a piece, but I'm not sure. Yeah, John? Yeah, for me, it's, um, I, I have perfect pitch, so I, a lot of times I associate uh, musical ideas with, with color. Um, the key of D minor is red, and the key of G minor is purple for me. And um, so a lot of times when I go to different, uh, in that fact, this poetry that I, when David showed it to me, the music immediately came to me, and that was kind of a first time for me. I, um, I've experienced uh, musical ideas from other things like uh, Picasso's Blue Period um, and different things like that, but a lot of times I, I, I'm starting in this period of my life of getting it from different um, mediums of art, um, poetry, paintings, and, um, and then I associate colors with that as well. So. Mm -hmm. It's funny to hear John say that because I actually also associate um, sound with color, uh, but D minor is sort of a light green for me. So. <laughs> um, you never, you never know. Um, for for me, I don't. I, I actually, despite that, I'm not sure that that helps me at all. Becoming inspired, I think I. In the end, you you always do have to wait, but there are. I think there are things that you can do as a composer to write. Well, you're still waiting for the inspiration, and it, it doesn't have to be—it doesn't have to be worse. It doesn't have to be uninspired. But there are things that you can work on in the piece that are not necessarily based on the inspiration. And often, I actually find that as I as I'm sort of getting into the piece, I think that I have a lot of good ideas at the beginning. But then there's there's a point where I'm thinking, why is why is there this one thing that I'm avoiding writing? And I realize that that there's something that I want to be writing that for whatever reason I've I've sort of put it aside or I want to you know distill it with something else and, and it's like there's there's the idea and I actually um, when I was it, it can come from a lot of things and it can come from other composers too and I, I had a moment earlier this year when I was working on the piece that um, is on the concert next Saturday when I heard um, a, a recording was released online of Polaris the Thomas Addis piece which is being played. Uh, on Sunday. next Sunday, and um, I heard it the first time, and I said, oh, oh, okay. And then I listened to it again like 10 times, and then uh, I thought, all right, this is how music works now. Um, and I think that actually, that can happen in listening to music, but it can happen in sort of anything in your life where you just be walking down the street and you see you know, a bird fly one way and the water crashes on the other side of the street, and you say, uh, uh, yeah, okay. And so the, um, turning that into music is obviously, <laughs> that's a challenge, but um, um, it, the inspiration has to come at some point. That's, that's really interesting. I have a question to ask. I always wanted to ask uh, uh, composers who 
see colors in sounds, like a B minor, D minor, light green. Now, my question is, when you see colors, do you hear chords? For example, if you see light green, do you, do you hear D minor? Right. I, I have a, um, I've actually thought about that a lot. Um, and the, the answer is really that, I mean, when you hear it, if you hear a natural D, something's playing a D in the world, it's not just the D, you have all the overtones at the same time. So essentially, that's more or less a D major chord. If you just have a D playing, you have the major third, and you have the perfect fifth, um, you know, you can sort of hear them if you try, but they certainly exist in the sound and in the vibrations. And so actually a D minor chord is, is sort of weird, um, you know, um, naturally, if you think about it, because the F natural isn't in the overtone series, so it's, there's actually some dissonance going on in, in a D minor chord. But for just, I think that's how it can work for just single notes. If you have A for me is sort of a dark red, it's what it really is is A major is a dark red. But I, I would say to that that uh, I think my Did inspiration. Did that answer your question? I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would I would say probably my D minor reference comes from uh, the movie Fantasia or Toccata and Fugue, and uh, by Bach. And so I think as a kid I would watched that forever and just associated that color, and then everything came from that. I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah. but it's the beginning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But, but I do hear chords, right. I do hear chords. I hear major, minor, I see. and I, I associate even augmented chords mm -hmm. and diminish. Uh, they have a different color to them um, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the shades of, uh, of their families. Yeah. So, I mean, I certainly, uh, I, I can certainly um, uh, understand how the key, different keys have different, different characteristics. I mean, no doubt about it. I mean, I go back to Mozart always and think about how he used the certain keys for certain things, and, and consistently he would go back to that always. Um, but does each composer, do, is it different for each composer, or is there sort of a universal uh, association with keys, or am, am I off on a tangent? I think it's a personal, personal reference, thing? right? Personal? Yeah, very personal, because uh, in repertoire, um, E flat major, sounds different in Mozart than Beethoven, for example. So um, I think it's, it's the way that each, each mind is wired. Yeah. And uh, it's personal. And, and certainly our time, uh, when we don't really think about those chords as the, the principal uh, foundation of how the music progress, um, that relationship becomes weakened if it if it ever uh, exists in our mind. Um, but certainly, as you mentioned, Mozart is very consistent mm -hmm. in using certain chords associated with characters. Mm -hmm. and, but you could find the opposite in Chopin, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, just to add to that, in the 20th or 21st century, there are so many different keys or scales. Right, there's so many different scales if you exactly. think of world music. It's uh, not just and also with microtonal also, I mean, uh, right. if a note between C and C sharp, what color would that be? So, and I think the platinum of uh, the color is really rich to think about it that way. And we have so many choices and so many materials to take inspiration from, so, yeah. What was, I can't even remember the question. Okay, where are we? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Over. Okay. Microphone is where? Where are we looking? Over here? Okay. Those of us who live around Monterey Bay are fortunate enough to be able to traverse musical eras in a very every short period of time every summer. Many of us have just been to the Carmel Bach Festival, and now we're here. And so, since you have confessed that composers listen to other composers' music, and since you, John, have mentioned that um, Bach had an influence on you via Disney, I'd very much like to know what influence particularly Bach had on each of you. I've listened very carefully and I don't hear anything of the Goldbergs in this week. <laughs> <laughs> Dylan, you want to start? Um, sure, I'll start. Um, I suspect my answer will be different from uh, everybody else because when I was growing up, I started playing cello when I was five and I just really didn't want to play Bach. When I, I just, um, I, you know, I actually, my first teacher moved to Maine, and when I was sort of trying out new teachers for my second teacher, 
my qualification was I only wanted to play music that was written after 1945. And um, so I, you know, I, found, I found the perfect teacher for me um, that way. And, um, and then as I got older, I, I feel like you know, there was a moment when I was 16 or 17 when I thought, Oh, I really wonder, you know, I hear everybody else in the world is playing the Bach cello suites, you know, let's see what they're all about. And, um, and so I sort of came at Bach from, uh, from behind. And, um, and I mean, it's, it's great. And I really, I really enjoy um, having a sort of perspective on, on Bach through music that was influenced by Bach that I knew first. I mean, when I th some, often when I think of Bach, I think about like Philip Glass, and you know a lot of Philip Glass it could be could be Bach chord changes arpeggiated and repeated, and and so when I'm thinking about Bach, I'm thinking about music that I knew first, and so that's that's really interesting. But um, but I've certainly grown to love Bach, and he influences me like he does everybody else. Well, Bach is a huge influence on on me for sure, um, but in particularly this this piece, I would say. Uh, Brahms would probably be uh, more my influence. Um, of course, I, I love Bach. There's a purity to it that just works. But I've found recently that uh, I bought a really wonderful collection of the Preludes and Fugues that I listen to, and I, I don't try to analyze them. I just listen to them. And it does a certain rewire. It's almost like a diagnostic for your computer. And I, I, I don't want to know too much more about it because it, it works without knowing too much more about it. <laughs> That's great. I, I think a, a lot of composers um, learn from Bach how to handle complexity, uh, how to, um, well, certainly counterpoint, of course, and uh, um, composers, when they go to university or college to study, will probably at some stage uh, get a, a chance to uh, handle bundles of lines, uh, sometimes in a similar way to Bach, or, or, or they may be asked to uh, imitate Bach. And uh, although some music students find it a, a chore, uh, I, I found it was one of the most important things I ever did as a student. Um, two-part inventions, three-part inventions, trying to get inside the mind of, of Bach to see how he did it, uh, how he wrote his fugues. And uh, I, I, I mean, I don't... I don't think my music sounds anything like Bach, um, and neither it should in the 21st century, but I think a lot of composers, even in their own time, uh, can learn the basics, can learn the fundamentals um, from people like Bach, the great contrapuntalists from the, pa the, the past, like Bach, and, and even earlier, uh, Palestrina is another favorite of mine, another contrapuntalist, a figure who um, <clears throat> uh, knew how to build huge, uh, uh, polyphonic constructions out of sometimes the, the simplest material, and that in itself is, is a great lesson to a composer at, uh, in any uh, time in history. Hmm. I have a uh, slightly different um, outlook about this. I was born in Iran, and music is improvised, and it's always contemporary. We don't know how the music sounded in 18th century or 19th century or 15th century. It's always contemporary. And, uh, but I found Western classical music so unique because it was notated. And because of the notation, we could go back to different styles from 12th, 13th century all the way to the present time. So for that reason, we have a lot of parents, musical parents. And it's a very unique relationship to some of these composers, and not only just composers to composers, but also performers someone who plays music of Mozart for 40 or 50 years and learns all the details about the life of Mozart probably would know more about Mozart than any of his family members. Mm -hmm. So it's a very special relationship. And uh, to me, uh, the picture of Bach, for example, um, I never had a picture of my grandfather, but when I was very young, I looked at the picture, the famous uh, official picture of Bach with the white beak and um, looked at it, it seemed to me so old. And over the years and decades, now every time I look at it, he looks much younger. <laughs> so so it's, a, it's a continuous uh, relationship. Um, and I think every composer learned from great masters, you know, and uh, uh, we learn the techniques, no matter it's Bach or Prostrina or 
uh, uh, you know, uh, um, different other composers. But I think uh, style is one thing we cannot learn. Uh, we don't write like Bach, and uh, we don't learn the way how Mozart write. Uh, I remember when I was uh, in Shanghai being a student, my teacher used to say, uh, you know, uh, I'm like a, a, a ground, a, an earth. Different students, you are different seeds. If you are apple seed, you come to my ground, you become an apple tree. If you have a peach tree, a seed, you become a peach tree. So uh, I always feel uh, that's very important to me. And no matter who I learn the techniques from, uh, the craftsmanship from, but I want to uh, at least show my own voice and have create my own style. And I think that's also what makes each composer unique also. Thank you. I have a rather self-indulgent question for James McMillan. I've always wanted to ask a major British composer uh, for their view on why in the United Kingdom, in the 20th and the, now the 21st century, there is this tremendous fecundity and creativity of so many composers, from Adensel to Walton, that have created so much wonderful music. I, mean, I listen most of the time to composers from the UK. From, from you back to Vaughan Williams. So I, that's my question. Well, um, <clears throat> it, the, the history of music in the United Kingdom is quite strange in many ways because we were we were out of it for many centuries, you, you could say, uh, when all the real uh, ferment of development was happening. It was all in mainland Europe. And uh, the, the, some of the French and Germans still have this uh, rather sniffy <laughs> attitude to uh, uh, <laughs> das Land ohne Musik. In fact, uh, uh, it's one of the, <laughs> the terms that uh, is used about us. But, but then something began to change uh, in the 20th century and we began to uh, grow our own again. But that's only part of the story because there has been a, a, a steady lineage uh, through history. Uh, before Vaughan Williams, of course, uh, there was Elgar and, and, um, and before him Handel, of course, we could kind of claim him <laughs> as our own in, in a way, and Purcell, uh, and working back through uh, from there to um, Orlando Gibbons and um, uh, Bird. Um, and before that, Dunstable and, and, and so on. So there's a, there's a rich um, uh, hinterland in British music. And I think when Vaughan Williams came along, people of his, composers and musicians of his generation realized just how rich uh, that uh, deep reservoir in, in British history was, and that's why he, that's why you can hear the the, the resonances of the, of the Renaissance and the resonances of uh, um, uh, the Reformation in something like the Fantasia of, on a theme by Thomas Tallis, um, where something very much of his time, and, and it would have been regarded as a, a great modern work uh, um, when it was written, but had this deep resonance of the past. And I suppose many British composers then have not been afraid of the past. Um, um, uh, uh, there have been uh, philosophical experiments in music in, the, in mainland Europe which tried to do away with the past, to try to uh, put a dam up to stop the influence of the past, and one can understand why that was the case. I mean, especially in Germany and, and France that had lived through this terrible uh, upheaval, uh, destruction of culture um, in, in the mid middle of the 20th century. They would want to start again, wouldn't they? Uh, and so they wanted to write uh, music and create art and maybe even build politics and structures, human structures, uh, out of nothing, uh, a fresh virgin field that had no taint of the past. We in Britain, of course, live through the same um, cataclysm, but have a very different attitude to the 20th century, I think, in the sense that we saw the past and tradition perhaps as, as our saving graces, yeah. or at least something that can give sustenance for the present. So I can think of many composers in Britain through the 20th and now in the 21st century who have a kind of um, healthy respect for the past without being old-fashioned or reactionary, as some people say we are. Um, this is a question for all of you, uh, we're, but we're with Marin in the lead. 
Um, given what we heard and were overwhelmed with last weekend in the hidden world of girls and its multimedia, multivisual, audio, all, so many arts together, so much expressiveness together, combinations, and then to have John's use of poetry and to have this incredibly rich discussion about color and music and references to so many of the arts together. Is there anyone here from uh, a headquarters at NPR who could, or, or, uh, who could put this, who could take so much of what Cabrillo is doing now in its 50th year and has been building to and is going to continue doing and, and spread it to a wider audience? Can you ever be filmed and get it out further? And, and how can you do that? Hmm. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, if I'm understanding your question is uh, how to, how to reach, reach a much broader audience, you mean from, uh, by disseminating what we do here more widely? Way more people to hear and see. Yes, you know, I, this is a discussion that we have sometimes, often, frequently. Um, and it's, a, I think it's a, I certainly think that's part of our future, uh, is to um, create some kind of online uh, experience so people can participate uh, from afar. I think it's, uh, I, I can't explain exactly why. I, I don't think it's be a fear of uh, corrupting the experience, really, by by sharing it more broadly. But I, I do think that there's something special about living in the moment and having the experience and moving on. I don't know. I, maybe that's a very selfish uh, view. Um, but I think there's something about this place that, I mean, it would be nice to, you know, you have to, to in order to start um, documenting everything, it requires a lot of um, technical capacity, a lot of investment, capital investment in equipment. It requires lots of um, changes in, in the way the musicians, uh, their relationship to the festival, because there are all kinds of union regulations that we seem to try to just pretend don't exist and we've <laughs> we've done quite well for 50 years um, but as soon as you go to all these kinds of you know uh, issues then it brings it to a different place do you know what I mean uh, and I guess while I I'm eager for everyone to know about it I'd rather they come to the Civic Auditorium in Santa Cruz I can't explain it uh, but I think that's where we've come to and I think the great thing is that many of the musicians um, take these pieces and these composers uh, and, and own them during the year and they promote them to their own orchestras. I certainly take many of the pieces I do here, many of the projects I do here around the world with me. Um, you know, no doubt about it that I will perform many of the works from this festival uh, throughout my career. So. You know, and I think the young conductors that sit here and this, the 30 or so conductors, and we had seven participants, but we had all these auditors too. You know, and I can see them, oh yeah, I like that piece, oh, I like that piece, or I, I know great. I mean, you know, something very practical. I, I think you've had many, many performances from our musicians, right? Absolutely. They say, well, we have a family concert, we wanna do your piece. Do you know what I mean? So there's something special in this day and age of everybody, um, what, what happened? <laughs> Did I do no, something no, wrong? Were you going to say something and nothing I just kept no. blathering? Um, I think there's something special in this day and age of, uh, of immediacy um, to being just living in the moment and, and then moving ahead, uh, for me anyway. But did you want to say something? No, I, I made a gesture. It was, oh, it was, was it a ferret? <laughs> okay. Uh, so... Anybody else? Oh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to ask each of the composers to tell us why you became a composer. Yeah, that's what I'd like to know, too. I'd like to know which end should we try? Let's start that way. Okay, I'm time. starting again. Um, yeah, that's always a fun question. For, for me, 
There, there are a couple, there are a couple stories that I tell that have become memories or were memories. Um, I'm not quite unsure at this point, but um, the the first is definitely true, which is that my um, first cello teacher, um, when she was teaching me to read music, she just had me write notes on the page um, to sort of you know explain that when you write this note, then it is an A or, or uh, something along those lines, and the the act of writing that down and seeing that you know I could pick one, and then it would create the sound if you played it that would you know have this whole emotional attachment to it was sort of stunning um, and exciting as a five-year-old certainly. Um, and uh, the other the other story is that um, back in in the days before iTunes, um, I had CDs and. Um, <laughs> Yeah, know, the days after records, um, and um, I only had I don't know five or six, and I would listen to them over and over again. And there was a certain point when I thought, why isn't there any more music? And I I could sort of think of other music that could exist, but it didn't, or at least I didn't think it did because I thought there were only five CDs in the world. <laughs> um, so I thought, I guess I have to write it, um, and so that's that's how I started. Well, I started, uh, I, I kind of knew early on um, um, being a violist, sitting sort of usually in fourth chair in the uh, middle of the orchestras, sometimes you hear, and I, I think I go back to the colors, I mean, you're sitting right in the center of the orchestra and you hear this free, from age five on up, you know, you're just inspired to, to recreate that. And um, um, instead of playing in an orchestra for 30 years, I thought, well, why don't I create uh, the magic. So that's kind of, I've always wanted to be one. So, uh, quick answer is um, as, as a kid, I was deeply moved by music. Um, my mom playing Stardust on the piano or a band, that's not funny. Um, <laughs> actually, it might have been. Um, a band playing, you know, the excitement of hearing a band play. And I, I, I just felt at that moment I needed to try and recreate that. I, and I think maybe for others, but I think on the selfish side, I wanted to recreate create it for me. So I kind of stayed with it. Well, I, I think I wanted to be a, a composer um, as soon as I was given a recorder when I was about nine years old, which is usually what happened, what, what happened to British school kids in the 1960s. And uh, although I didn't know what it would mean uh, at that stage, but the, the desire to write music came, for me, came almost simultaneously with making my first notes on a little squeaky instrument. <laughs> Amazing. To me, um, I attended the Tehran Music Conservatory at age nine, and immediately I was drawn to you know, making up my own sound. And I told my violin teacher, uh, saying that I'm really interested in composition, and I was hoping to hear a word of encouragement. <laughs> yeah, that's and he said, don't. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to have another composer after Bach and Beethoven and Mozart? <laughs> So it was such a huge disappointment for me at that time. And then I had to wait until I came to the United States to pursue composition um, formally. However, I continued to write my own music in a small scale. And at age 16, 17, I was, um, while attending music conservatory, playing you know, Prokofiev, Beethoven, and Mozart, um, I taught in small towns and small villages. Uh, I taught the youngsters through the Orf, Karl Orf uh, uh, technique. And, uh, and I realized that, that that music, that sound is foreign to these small villages. And I uh, changed it and took their own uh, folk songs and arranged it uh, with the Karl Orf instrument, like xylophone. and and the tambourine, and that had a huge impact on me. Certainly, I learned so much from them, and until I came here in the United States to continue formally. Um, to me, actually, my father also is a composer. So when I was very little, he always tell me, you know, you must be a composer in the future. <laughs> uh, and I always has rebellion against that. So I start playing the piano. And uh, talk about Bach, I still remember I was uh, playing this Bach piece and uh, 
uh, in a recital, I was very young, and I, I always had terrible stage fright and had memory slips. So my teacher told me, you know, no matter what happened, just keep going, don't stop, you know, don't go back to the beginning and play again. So I, I was thinking, yeah, I was thinking, what, which finger should I put down next? <laughs> and then here this was a mistake, and then I was like, oh my God, I, I have to stop, you know. And then I was like, okay, I have to keep going. So I start improvising in the Bach style. You know? <laughs> So, uh, and then I've managed to finish it, and I pick up where I left off somehow, you know, uh, and then I finished it. And to my surprise, some people did not notice. I, uh, you know, <laughs> went off the track. Uh, so my piano teacher talked to my father. He said, you know what, your son, I don't think he could be a pianist, but you know, he should <laughs> let him be a composer. Uh, so after that, I was, my, my father was telling me about the benefit of being a composer. You know, you could play your own music. No one would know you make a mistake. And, <laughs> and you could play on the score. You know, you don't need to memorize it. And uh, so that was my first uh, hook to uh, writing music. So, yeah. <laughs> I think one of the things we don't remember, though, it's, it, is that uh, when, you're, when you're a kid, you don't have the kind of boundaries or, or preconceptions that I know that... Uh, my son Auden, occasionally, not not frequently, but I think it's happened two or three times in his life. He will say to me, "I'm going to write some music now." And I think, "Well, yeah, good luck with that," you know. But, but and then he gets the manuscript out and he writes his music, and then he's done with that. And you know, there's no, there's no. Sen I think we always. Uh, for me, it's a daunting. You know, I think, "Oh my God, the symphony! Are you going to write a symphony? It's going to be," you know. The way you approach when you're a kid, you just it's very um, organic and and things are much I think less daunting, aren't they? You just feel oh I'm, I don't know what happened to the music he wrote, but yeah. <laughs> anyway, next, next question mm -hmm. over here in the one. Okay, as someone who also associates color with music, <laughs> I was wondering um, how you incorporate that. Um, way of thinking into your own performing or, yeah, performance as well as composition too. The color thing. Okay, I'm starting again. Um, well, for me, the, when, when I'm creating a piece, I almost always start with some sort of um, emotional map and uh, it's the, the way that works varies. Like uh, the, with the piece for Cabrillo, my my room, all four walls were just covered in huge butcher paper and there's just massive scribbles all along that's theoretically on a timeline. Um, but but the, the way I think about it is certainly emotional. Um, and e even in music that you know has absolutely no program or is not meant to portray anything at all, there, you know, it, it's, still, it's still a sort of diagram of, of emotion through time, the audience still has a reaction to this note and this chord, et cetera. And so for me, the way that color fits into that is that um, I can, it's, I mean, I don't want to say it's like painting because it's not really, but but in some ways the the color can um, present a, a more clear idea of how something, a chord or, or um, a few notes can exist um, as emotion. Well, actually, it is kind of like painting for me. <laughs> um, um, the different uh, chords. Um, um, yeah, I, 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 I see a lot of, of colors, especially this particular piece, because it's, um, um, except for the tonal section, uh, there's a lot of um, um, aleatoric uh, things of that sort, um, um, parts that are in, in the score. And so for me, I mean, that's like a Crayola box in, in a way, because there's just a lot of different colors, different notes and things that are going on for me. So, so it's a big part of my process, for sure. Was there another question? Uh, I wasn't sure. I thought someone over here had a question. Oh, yeah. Good afternoon. Um, just in response to the lady's question, I would like to say that I want to thank Marin also because her first year happened to be the first year I attended this festival. And there are at least 24 pieces that I've done in my career 
bit of that I've heard here first. Wes is a fine conductor. So um, I do have a question, though. It, um, just want to let you know that it, it's working. Oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> so, um, you know, we, we were talking about a little bit about Ravel, I mean, the, the story. And, and, of course, Ravel can be associated with the, with the piano. There are many pieces of his and uh, other composers that he eventually orchestrated. And I'd like to ask the, the composer panel, especially in terms of brilliance of orchestration that that happens now that it's it's hard to imagine you know it ever being played on the piano um, as as a work um, where do you start are you starting with the thought of a short score keyboard um, or are you thinking in terms of orchestra orchestrational color uh, right off the bat as you compose why don't we start this in one more. okay uh, I think um, Nowadays, is not too much difference from before. It depends on what you do. And for me, I actually still use a piano to write music, to test it. And I, I do have perfect pitch, but still I can sing six or seven notes at the same time. So um, I know some composers use computer to write music. Uh, but to me, actually, I, 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 I do use computer to do notation, but I actually don't never listen to the playback and I choose not to uh, because uh, uh, I still want to train my ears to have the sensitivity of listening to the orchestra instruments um, when I write them. So to orchestration, I think that is uh, an, an art to itself. Uh, some composers write piano short score first and then orchestrate it. Uh, in my own way, I, I actually write it in directly. No matter when I write for orchestra or write for opera, I just from bar one, all the way from top to bottom, bottom up, this way, that way, so, yeah. Well, I don't play the piano. I certainly play a few things, um, uh, you know, two notes at a time. But um, one of the greatest thrill of composing is to write for orchestra, and I hear it in my head. And uh, obviously, I will check some of the notes on the piano. Um, However, I would like to comment about the relationship between piano and, and, and music in Western culture. Uh, perhaps it's the most influential instrument shaping the language of Western music, at least in the last three, four hundred years. Um, majority of composers, all the way to the 19th century, uh, were pianists, and they composed their works on the piano, so they were bound by the by the sequences and patterns that only make sense on the piano. Um, if it didn't have the piano, probably the course of musical history in West would be slightly different. Uh, for that reason, in Renaissance, when music was not conceived as, the, uh, as a keyboard instrument, uh, it's, it's, the language is different. But uh, in 19th century, certainly Berlioz, who didn't play the piano, you could feel the music only makes sense as an orchestral experience. Yeah. Well, I think uh, just as the computer can sometimes be a hindrance, more of a hindrance than a help, sometimes the piano can also be a hindrance. Because if one is writing for orchestra or even for choir, the last thing that you really want to hear uh, is the sound of the piano. It, it, it can be misleading. And, and so I, I think it's, it's important for me, and I, I think many composers I speak to, to um, train the, the ear, the inner ear, is like a muscle, so that you can imagine uh, the full extent of the, the, the coloristic possibilities of, of any score. Um, throughout the 20th century, the, the, the idea of color, the idea of um, uh, orchestral or instrumental timbre became almost as important as melody and harmony and rhythm uh, itself and uh, that, that's a marvelous addition uh, and extension of the compositional palette um, so I, 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 uh, I, I mean I have a piano in my study and I, I do like to use it to check chords and things but to be honest um, it, it's much more exciting to do it without <coughs> the stabilizing influence, if you like, uh, of, of a piano or, or a computer? Uh, I try it kind of always. And when one isn't working, I'll move on to the other. It's back to that conjuring issue I mentioned. Um, in fact, with that said, right before I came to the festival, I sent out a sketch, uh, a project to a client, and it was three staves of piano. But, you know, trust me, I know 
which is going to be the horns and when the woodwind filigree is happening on top. I mean, no pianist could play it, but it's notated. It, so I, I use it as a crutch to get ideas down so that I can move on to orchestration. And just one last thing. A lot, we, we talked about the use of keys and how uh, certain composers use them uh, specifically. I think you mentioned Mozart. Um, for me, the, the key comes down to not, not colors per se, but who's going to be featured. If there's a singer, how am I going to flatter that singer with, with what range or if, if, if I want a, a French horn passage that I want to sound sweet, I want to make it playable by them. So a lot of, for me, the lead is the most important consideration for key. Just want to mm -hmm. insert that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, I'll keep it short, but uh, on my, in my film and TV work, I compose mainly on piano, um, but I have the ideas, similar to you, Craig, um, of what it's going to sound like. In the composition world, I, I hear the orchestra. So I, I, for this project, I'd go down to, uh, to the beach, uh, to a beach house down in Southern California, and the, and the couple would always, that I was staying with, they would, where are you going? You, 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 we don't have a piano, where are you gonna write? And I'm like, I just need a room, basically. <laughs> because uh, as um, James was saying, you, you, just, you, just, you develop this, this ear to hear um, 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 the voicings, and so I, I hear it as an orchestra. I, I don't I don't hear it and then blow it out. I hear it as an orchestra. So yeah, I think I'm on about the same page. I I'm not very good at piano, and when I do I I do use the piano a lot when I'm writing, but it's only as because the piano has the most keys and you have the most fingers to to play those notes with so you can get as much as possible on the piano but but um, it's definitely true that that it can be a hindrance and that it's um, equal tempered um, and so and so once again you're you're missing a lot of opportunity and sometimes what I what I do if I want to hear a chord that's not equal tempered is I, I take my guitar and I retune some of the strings and you know you can retune you have six open strings so you can usually create um, any chord you want more or less um, and uh, that's sort of fast, easy way to to find non-equal tempered chords and hear them. I just would like to echo one thing that James mentioned. It's, it's important uh, that inner ear is um, is uh, perhaps the most important part of the composing, and that explains why Beethoven, while was deaf, mm -hmm. composed yeah. uh, some of the best uh, of his masterpieces. So, he relied on his inner ear whether he was able to hear uh, physically or not. So that inner ease, uh, particularly for orchestral music, is key. If you listen to the late Beethoven string quartets, I think that, uh, I don't think anyone living in his time that could have heard uh, would have written that music because it's so avant-garde. And, you know, his, he had no ability to censor what he was doing. And also, uh, from a player's perspective, he gives you instructions that are uh, well beyond what the notation of the day ever called for. You know, for example, he'll have a, a note, uh, it's just a held note, and he ties an eighth note to an eighth note to a quarter to an eighth note. So he's trying to send you a message, too, that how he's even thinking of a held note. I mean, for me as a violinist, you know, it's an, it, and I'll never forget hearing my parents play, were, were rehearsing, their quartet was rehearsing the the Grossa Fugue from the late string quartet, and I remember thinking to myself as I was upstairs, God, I, I hate contemporary music. <laughs> <laughs> really, I'm serious. And when I told my, you know, I was about 11, and I came downstairs and I told my parents, you know, I'm never going to like new music. And my parents were like, that was Beethoven. And I, I couldn't believe it. I really thought they were pulling my leg. So, so maybe it is that inner ear thing. Um, well, I hope, uh, and I hope you, it's a new experience or, or at least a different experience for you all to spend time with each other. I, I, there's nothing I enjoy more than seeing all these composers talking to each other and uh, admiring each other's work. I think that is also a, a, another wonderful byproduct of the Cabrillo Music Festival. But mostly um, having you all here today, thank you for joining us. Thanks everybody, and uh, I hope to see you at the concert tonight. Thanks. Thank you.